Uh, home mage. It is our yeah. ritual. Yeah. I can write about homophobia in my life in ways that no interviewer could ever capture. It's very important for us to not just think about the other, but, you know, connect, you know, emotionally. It's really asking an awful lot of a researcher to be reflexive <laughs> now I come to think about it. <laughs>
<laughs> when I was at university, you know, studying philosophy, I used, <laughs> I used to hang out with the philosophy crowd and the drama crowd, and then go bottom and play rugby on, on Wednesday afternoons and Saturdays. And they, they were saying, what are you doing with that lot? Because there was such yeah. a division between the... And I don't want to set it up as a binary, but I lived both to, to, to the full, you know, mm. playing rugby, getting really, really fit, and you know, getting, engaging in all that kind of robust stuff. Mm. But at the same time, you know, immersing myself in philosophy, I just, you know, and that's, that's what I do now. I mean, I still, really what I do, I feel, is philosophy, really. Mm. You know, um, so, so what's this is showing maybe my preconceptions, but being a physical guy yeah. and to go into philosophy, what what happened there then? What led you on that? It, I, it's my my dad was really damaged by the war, you know, both physically and I think mentally, although I didn't realise at the time. But dad used to read all the time. You know, he was a working class guy. He worked for the local council as a labourer and stuff. Um, but he always went every Friday. He went to our library. And he brought home his books and he would read. You know, because we, we didn't have a TV until I was about 11 or 12 in our little house. So dad was, I'm, I'm sure that had an influence mm. upon me. Um, my mum and dad were always hugely encouraging. So I used to read a lot. I can remember reading, you know, comics. I can remember reading Richard Crompton's William stories, you know, and loving it, you know, spending yeah. hours. So I think the reading was probably the start of it all, really. Mm. I can't, I can't, you know, we didn't used to philosophise. My dad yeah. was a strong working class man, and you know yeah. he was you know involved with, in, in the labour movement and all of that sort of stuff. So we would, talk, as I got older, you know, doing A levels and things, mm. we taught politics. I did my, so I did my O levels as was then at Cornwall Technical College, Cornwall So I used to stay in lodgings through the week. I used to hitchhike from Lanson down to Camborne, stay in lodgings, yeah, study for the week, and then hitchhike. At home. fourteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, I left school. Uh, my birthday is in August '47, so I left school when I was just 15. I went to Campbell to do my O-levels. So, but it was at that time when this whole '60s kind of renaissance started. <laughs> and, you know, getting, being out of my mum and dad's way for yeah. the bit, I started to grow my hair. And, and dad couldn't handle it. You know, he saw it as being effeminate, it's scruffy, all of the cliches. You know, which now we think are bizarre. Yeah, at the yeah. time, they were really meaningful. Mm. My dad would give me some money on, on Friday or Saturday to go down and get your bloody hair cut. Yeah, yeah. It was all bad. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was, it was really bad, you know. So we, we kind of fell out over that. Hmm. It takes a lot for us to work out what those dynamics were. And when I use the word dynamics, I mean it in a material sense. You know, what, those, what those energies, yes. those forces were. We always got on, but I suppose... Um, I mean... I've written about this. Um, I was part of a fathers and sons panel at okay. QI a few yes. years ago. Okay. After my mum, after my dad died, my mum was going through his study. He used to read massively. And mum, mum was going through this book about the D-Day landers. My dad was in the commandos. Wow. And mum, mum found a picture of dad in this book, in, in a landing craft. Wow. It's amazing. She, yeah. she was like, she said, look at this, you know. Because there yeah. is a my dad with a cigarette in his mouth, a smile on his face, yeah. looking up to the camera. It's amazing. Yeah, it I've got it on my wall at home now. Yeah. Okay. But what I thought about when I wrote this paper was, I was born in 47, two years after the end of that terrible war, you know. So what, you know, what dad and all of his generation must mm. have carried home with them, you know, then to live in family life. So there were a lot of times when it was kind of silent in the home, it was never sad. But... I think, you know, in terms of how I got on with me, it must have been, it's easy to look challenge, but with Foucault and all the discourses that construct us, and yeah, yeah. they're normative, but there are strong materialities. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about living in that little cottage with my mum and dad, you know, being in a bucket at night, and then yeah. mum used to carry it out, and, you know, she's a proud woman, but she had to carry, she had to carry mm. the bucket out the front door, down the street, up the back steps, you know. You know, things like mm. that. Mm. Remember, yeah. Going to the loo, up the steps, and being frightened because it was dark. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, so you know, those are materialities as well as they're not just. And they come with strengths. Totally, totally. When you yeah, think of yeah. what philosophy is, to hear you talking that that's what the subject mm -hmm. is that you studied, mm -hmm. because certainly when I was growing up, like philosophy was really highbrow and it was just. It wasn't yeah. a subject that any normal person within my <laughs> circle would ever even contemplate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, nobody in my family had gone to university. No, me too. Um, mm. So philosophy wasn't for the likes of us. You were um, 
I don't know, secretaries, <laughs> secretaries mm -hmm. or... If you think about the tripartite secondary system, that's what how it was, it was delineated, yeah. well, delineated wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so in the secondary modern school, if we were boys, we were going to be mechanics or shop assistants yes. or, you know, something of that order. Yes, exactly. You know? yeah. exactly. And that was, you know, most of what, that most that you could expect mm -hmm. in what you were going to do. Mm. And philosophy is right on the top end of the disembodied yeah. scale, whereas the working, <laughs> body, yeah. working bodies is... Well, I still get it. Now, I go down to our local pub and yeah, I see guys there, good old working class guys, they say, all right, again, still teaching, are you? As if to say, you know, have yeah. you got a real job yet? <laughs> <laughs> and one of the major things that Deleuze brings out in his approach to philosophy, it's almost an anti-philosophy in the sense that he says, you know, we don't, we shouldn't think of like concepts existing in some other place in a library or in heaven or whatever. Concepts should always be created. We should always be creating concepts. This is, you know, he argues that every every new concept that we create is an event. And it took me ages to kind of understand what he meant by that. A lot of his work is influenced by Spinoza and Nietzsche mm -hmm. and so on. But when I got it, it's, it's it's just it's fantastically illuminated because it's it's a, it's a totally creative business. What he's it's, so rather than going from the position of asking what is. You ask the question, the transitive question, what if? What if? So, I've got this idea, yeah, and I think this is a really great idea. What if I plug it in here? What if I, what if I share it with you? What if I do it with my students? So it moves into a kind of transitive mode, which is, is hugely different from the traditional which view, epistemological view, which says that, you know, what, what is it? What is the cause and effect? What is that being? What is that category of difference which separates it from that? You know, what's the difference between a man and a woman? The binary divisions, what's the difference between nature and culture and so on? Yep. It shifts it away from that and it creates what he calls this kind of philosophy of, philosophy of the event. And as I sort of you know, started to read this stuff, I thought, this is just fantastic. It's, it's fantastic in terms of pedagogy and I think it's fantastic in terms of research. It gave me the kind of theorising behind what we used to call student-centred learning. Because yes. rather than me teaching you, mm -hmm. I say, what, what do you think, Katrina? What's your view on this? Come on, David, how does that mm -hmm. compare with yours? So that you, you put it into that student-centred right. modality, yeah? You, it, I joke about philosophy as being dead men, what mm -hmm. dead men said. You know, it usually is men, not always. Dwems. Dwems, dead white European males. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, look of horror on my face. One of the things I say to the stu any research methods teaching that I do with new, new students is there's three things that I'm passionate about. Mm. One is writing songs. Mm -hmm. I've never been taught that. Never been taught to play music. Never been taught to write songs. Second is surfing. I've never yeah. been taught to surf a wave. No, they have one lesson. The third right. is qualitative research. Right. People have attempted to teach that to mm. me. Not very well, I don't right. think. But I and it didn't help. Right. That's lovely. So it's yeah. the it's That's the bit it's actually the it's not the received wisdom right. of what is <laughs> yeah, yeah, what yeah. I'm hearing, what yeah, is sure. wow are things yeah. out there. But it's what, what if and we do it. Yeah. We, do we it. go and serve. We uh, go and we pick up a got a, 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 he says you've got this idea. And then you go, and you plug it in. You see what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that you've, you know, you've got an idea of how to take a wave, mm -hmm. or you've got an idea about how to carry out a bit of inquiry. Okay. So rather than read all the accepted wisdom on that, right. you just do it. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 putting it into that kind of modality of of transition, of taking you from one place to another. That's a really nice articulation of, of a philosophy of research or a philosophy of mm. pedagogy if that's the right way of putting we it. We learn that the people that teach mm. us are our participants mm. or possibly it's also have not with our own life experience. Mm. You know, I think you can have those kinds okay. of conversations with the literature. So students will say to me, mm, I, I read Deleuze but I don't think I got it. And I say, you get it in whatever way you do. Just get it in the way that you do and do something with it mm -hmm. and, and, and see what happens with that. You know, rather than think there's something definite that you've got to get. Mm. Yeah? There's, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. there's not one fixed meaning. Rather than thinking about you as a being, mm -hmm. a particular fixed body that ends with your skin, yeah. but think of yourself as becoming. Mm -hmm. That you're becoming writer, becoming philosopher, becoming surfer, becoming man, becoming camera. Mm. In other words, we're always becoming. I've been teaching yeah. for 40 years, but mm -hmm. I'm still becoming a teacher.
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Rather than trying to arrive somewhere. Or yeah, but it's, there's not, a, there's never a, an arrival point. Mm-hmm. So there's right. a sense in which you know, as we engage with whatever it is we do, we're always starting mm-hmm. in the middle. Mm-hmm. There's always, a, a, you know, it's mm-hmm. never. There's not, there's not a fixed point per yeah. se. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I find that really attractive. Yes. So it's, it breaks down the kind of categories of difference and the binaries, you know, which says, well, that's, you know, I, I mean, I, I, am, I examined a PhD in Bristol. You'll know the person, mm-hmm. um, a, 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 a young, a, a person who was transgendering. Okay. And the, the, it was an autoethnography of tran- transgendering. It was fantastic mm. because the movement from male, if you like, to female, if you like, mm. as categories of different, were completely dissolved through the autographic and ontological nature of the life. I, mm. I can't say his life because yeah. it was this transgendering yeah. life. Yeah. So there's a sense in which in, that tr- in those transgendering moments and movements there was always becoming, becoming mm. other. And it was, a, I found it hugely moving, but it was also a really powerful piece of work, mm. a really powerful piece of writing, because it was very ontologically infused, but it was very much of these... <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, There's an, what is? Research is to find out what is. Mm-hmm. And we will arrive there. Mm. It's not becoming. Yeah. It's about yes. being, arriving, yeah. finding the destination. Getting the done. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Whereas what you're talking about now is, I would I would argue that in uh, I would argue that data is an event, yeah. That that, that 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 actually what we supposedly collect and then analyse, which is the binary construction of most traditional research mm. methods, courses, and yes. research practices, is actually an, is, a, is an artifact. Because you know, for example, you know, it, we could argue that your your film today yeah. is, is 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 a piece of data. But it's an event which has been generated and, and therefore. It's eventful, yes, yeah? and it's part of what Spinoza calls duration. It's about eventuality. Yes. Yeah, there's a sense in which it's moving on. You know, if if this goes viral, <laughs> 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 I'm sure it will. Uh, like. It will be processual. It will it will have it will be instigative of, of other events. You know, it will be part of mm-hmm. process. So when Whitehead says that process it always precedes substance, you know, we should, so rather than thinking about substance as being something fixed, you know, male, female, dog, cat, or whatever, we have to think about these processes of, of, of as being instigative of change. Not to do away with the idea that we are substantial, mm. but these, tr- you know, about what you were saying about David and the sea, yeah. And the the, the, mm-hmm. the the movement through the water and yes. you know that that whole you know Donald Haraway says our bodies don't end with our skin and I love that idea yes. of our molecularity and the sense of temperature I can I can Absolutely, start the sun yeah. coming out a little bit then you know no. yeah. if I was a student you know back to the early stages of MSc in exercise and health science let's say um, I'm seeing data as a way of as not an event, am I? I'm, I'm seeing it as a product or a, mm. a, an artifact, yeah. an object almost. Mm. What, how would you, what would you say to me as an MSc student? To Researchers, there's no such thing as a view from nowhere. Yeah. Every view is from somewhere. You know, but in other words, we've all got a stance. We're all, we've all got positionality. We're all yeah. ontologically predisposed by things that I've been talking about, say my background or the books I've read or whatever. So then there's a sense in which you've got to problematise that which has been produced or that which has been collected and analysed. Yeah? You've got to, to problematise that. So rather than answering that question directly, I would, I would be offering up that view to them. And then I would, I, would, I would want to encourage them to think about, well, therefore, you know, how would you do, view this? Do we all view this differently? You know, if we are taking your perspective, your perspective, my perspective, and then we become circumspective, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, isn't there? Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's, it's kind of, I suppose, rather than replacing one set of answers with another, mm-hmm. it's shifting from one set of answers where cause and effect have supposedly been established to yeah. just troubling that, yeah. to troubling those waters, you know, to, you know, Another more water metaphors, yeah, but tr- troubling those waters, you know, setting up these problematizations and encouraging them to think more so that they can become, yeah. be in that process of becoming researchers. Hello. Hello. <laughs> A whole idea that Laura Richardson puts forward of, 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 of 
writing as a method of inquiry mm -hmm. for me has been hugely inspiring, motivational. Mm -hmm. Jonathan and I have, have done something with Laurel Richardson's idea of writing as a method of inquiry by talking about collaborative writing yeah. as a method yes. of inquiry. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of making any great claims for it, um, but I mean, Laurel, I think when she talked about it, you know, she was talking about it as a as a newly reformed mm. sociologist. And so yeah. I think she was seeing it in a much more individual way. And I think what we've tried to bring to it is, well, okay, you know, how can we think about writing as a method of inquiry in collaborative yeah, times? Yeah. You know, yeah. what happens after, when Ken and Jonathan exchange yeah. emails about a particular topic over a period of time? Something shifts, yeah, yeah. something moves, yeah? Something's transitional, transformative. In those, in those, you know, those movements in mm. moments, you know, it's, it's really important. Yeah. And I saw, that's, that's always been, since I read it, I mean, it blew me away. Yeah. Now I'm really interested now in the kind of new materialisms, affect theory, post-human ways of thinking, you know, which go beyond the human. Yeah. In other words, it takes into into account Spinoza's idea that everybody, yeah, human bodies but material bodies have the power to affect and be affected. You know, we've been affected by that food. It's made us feel yeah. good. It's you know, it's digested. It's changed our system. So that yeah. what she argues, what he argues, is that everything has the the capacity to affect and be affected and it affects what bodies can do that's i think that's important there's a sense in which we're collaborating like this the yes. sound effete we're collaborating with nature yes. and nature's kind of collaborating with us yeah. and that's part those are parts of the collaborations you mm -hmm. know it's it's breaking down the idea of being a group of people the yeah. sociological or the mm -hmm. social psychological idea of being a group of people and thinking about deleuze guitar's idea of the assemblage which brings yes. in People, mm. objects, the time of day, the lovely That's food we've know. had. No, no, they don't know. No. And why would they? <laughs> no, it's like Laurel Richardson stuff, that mm. writing is a, a way of inquiry. Until I actually, and you described about the joy of understanding Deleuze, so yeah. that makes sense. It wasn't until I actually got to a piece of writing that I was learning in the process of writing mm. that I discovered that feeling mm. and that joy and this wow this is amazing yeah. what i'm writing here is teaching me something mm. that's yeah. coming out of my body so what if i just start writing to it you know i've got a problem i've got an issue i can't work something out well i'll just open up that space and i'll yeah. just write to it you know yeah. with no particular ambition in mind other than to write and that i mean i don't know how that how you feel about that but for me that's been hugely formative and transformative a lot of my work yeah comes out of last night's dream, I get up, hardly dressed, go into my little study and write, mm. yeah? Probably with a fragment of an idea. Mm. And whatever comes out may not gestate, may not gestate into something. Which is that... exactly opposite from what we're asked to do in teaching mm. practice, which is identify in advance what the student's going to learn. Absolutely. And then teach to that. And I've always method, struggled with that. Method. And what do we do on research? Which is hugely what, what, yeah. what do we have? Yeah. yeah. It's hugely anticipatory. And it doesn't take the, into consideration the possibility that as a, an inquiring person, you're changing. Yeah. You're changing all the time. Qualitative inquiry, I think, is, is, no, it's, it's looking for the complexity that's involved in that. It's looking for the meanings behind a particular response. Yeah. You know, we're asking questions like, you know, is this a gendered space? You know, is this a space which is ethnicized? Is it to do with our, our sexuality? Is it, you know, yeah. and we, we start to infuse our inquiries about meaning with all of those possible sort of dimensions and relationality. Yeah. You know, we are not simply saying we've got a measurement that person X does this and person Y does that. We've got to actually qualitatively ask why they're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, what are the what are what are the backgrounds in terms of our experience that infuse that? Come on, tease me. Just like legging the dog off the lead. I can't, can't keep up with it. I've always loved being in the sea and I think over a period of time because I've become more interested in these more kind of fluid sort of philosophies you know people like Nietzsche and Deleuze and, and, and others I found there's a real kind of resonance between my experience of the kind of flows and the ties and the eddies of 
being in the sea, but water generally, and the way in which you know, my thought and feeling and affect moves. So I feel, I don't use the, the sea as being symbolic. I actually feel, as we were talking about earlier, that actually when I'm in the sea, there's a, there's a certain energy there which is, has something similar in feeling to when I'm writing and when the, when the, when the writing's really got to flow. So I think the sea is always important. I've written... How important is it to your scholarship to be outside or to be inspired by you know, the environment that we're in? H hugely. I mean, we've just had a discussion and we're, we're sort of mystified how academics can sit and read and write and work in their offices. <laughs> and I think that, in a sense, is the kind of other side of what I'm thinking about. I mean, the experience that we've just had of, you know, walking along the beach, experiencing the birds, the, the wind, the sea and, and everything of that kind. I find it's hugely enriching for my, for my body. And I think so I, when I ever I go to the beach, apart from today, I take my notebook with me and I don't know, I just find myself writing, I suppose. So I come out of the water, sit down, providing it's not too cold, I, just things things start to come out. So it's it's often stuff that never takes anything any shape as anything other than a few jottings or a sort of scrambled sort of poem. But sometimes you know ideas emerge or you know little pieces of writing which later find themselves in paper that I might publish or something like that. And it's. It's not a contrivance, it's just something, there's a kind of, there's a kind of fusion going on there, really, between how uh, I write and what I like to write about and the actual experience of being by the sea, in the sea and by the seaside, I think. Yeah.